Hello. Great to see you all out here today. Um, I'm Jack. And it's very early in the morning. I'm not a morning person, so if some of you are feeling like this, um, I can completely sympathise. I, um, I thought I might have some sort of plinth to stand behind today. I've got a bit of a limp. I had a uh, knee reconstruction about uh, a couple of months ago, and I haven't been able to shed that limp yet. So um, I think uh, my, my barista calls it swagger, um, which I quite like. Um, it, I probably shouldn't call him my barista because um, we don't pay a full-time coffee person, but um, he calls it swagger. So if anyone asks, how is Jack Mustard, don't sort of say, it was, a, it was a bit creepy how he, he sort of slid around the stage with a limp. Let's say swagger. So um, failure led myself and one of my business partners to graphic design. I went to high school with both of them um, and followed through to university. And it was around uh, year 10 art where myself and Dan were, um, were studying uh, painting and pottery. And I decided to paint this um, a Da Vinci piece of baby Jesus. Um, I've got no idea why I painted that, that particular piece um, or even attempted it, um, but I had a crack. And I think I must have run out of yellow paint because it, um, it ended up looking like a mix between Benjamin Button and Gollum's love child. Around the same time, Dan was studying pottery. And he produced a piece not too dissimilar to this one. Um, he'd worked ages on it, it was lovely, and he put it in the kiln, and it exploded. Um, and it blew up everyone else's work as well. It was around this time that our art teacher said, have you heard of graphic design? And we said, no. Um, she said, you get to create cool stuff on computers. And that was definitely enough for us. So we followed that through to university, um, and then we opened Motherbird. Um, this was us not long ago. I thought I might graduate to the medium shirt, but I'm still wearing the small one. Yeah, we look a bit older now. And this is some of the work that we produce. I'll um, get to my topic now. So I wanted to talk about personal identity and ideas. Um, I'm very much of the school of thought that the things that you endure, the places you go, the people you meet, um, the good, the bad, all of, all of that sort of those experiences and moments um, influence the way that you generate ideas. So the way that we think shapes the work we produce, and you're probably thinking, that's pretty obvious. You know, whoever we are is, is what we're going to produce. But uh, we live in quite a fast-paced world where clients and ourselves are expecting to have answers straight away. They're expecting um, certain looks and feels. They, they know exactly what they want, and then they, they instill that in us. So we're often under pressure to just generate work, and there's so much stuff out there that's just work. And I think we're losing this, losing sight of how to come up with ideas and how to think properly. But how do you get an idea? I think more often than not, you think, okay, well, let's sit around, let's, let's brainstorm. And, you know, sometimes we brainstorm in the studio, and it, it's pretty good to get an idea flowing, um, but I think the, one of the dangers with brainstorming is when you expect a result. Because when you start to expect a result, you start to force ideas and, and put pressure on the situation. And a lot of the time when you're brainstorming, you're not actually ready to come up with an idea. Ideas don't just strike like that. Like that you can't hear, can you hear that? Um, uh, there was a study done on brainstorming and uh, they found it was quite a big thing back in, back in the ad days, this brainstorming phenomenon. And there was a recent study done that found that if they separated everyone into individual, you know, they went and did their own thing, came up with a whole lot of ideas and brought them back and pulled them together, then it was a whole lot more effective. Word association. Um, this is another one that people might use to come up with ideas if they're stuck. And we often find that it's just a whole lot of people saying a whole lot of weird words that make no sense whatsoever. Again, another study was done around, around uh, word association and how more often than not, if I say red, you'll say apple or whatever it is. And um, people come up with these common answers, so there's often not um, that level of, um, uh, I suppose, differentiation between, between coming up with ideas there. So we often don't use that one. Experimentation, that's really terrific to 
I suppose, generate responses, visual responses, but in terms of coming up with ideas, it's doing, not thinking. And then inspiration. I fucking hate this one. There's so much nice stuff out there. You would have all seen blogs, whether you're interior designers, artists, um, graphic designers, architects, whatever. There's all this nice stuff out there. And it's always out of context. And we all see it all, we all look at it, and then we all interpret it in our work somehow. And we end up doing what everyone else is doing. So inspiration really annoys me. And I've tried to get away from that a lot. I think when I started, we were always looking at what other people were doing and worrying about that. And now I find that we've just got to get away from it. So if you do say to someone, how did you come up with that idea? It's probably not going to be, well, I said red, he said apple, one thing led to another and we, and we had an idea. It's usually going to be, I don't know. And the reason that it's I don't know is ideas are so deeply instilled in our experiences. They're not, uh, they're not something, you might be able to pinpoint a situation when you came up with the idea, but what led it to that is a whole lot of different factors. Um, you know, it might be when you learn to unlatch your cot at two years old. It might have been when you uh, developed OCD in an early age. It might have been when, when you kicked through autumn leaves and, um, on, a nice, on a nice day. It might have been when you paid too much for coffee in Sydney. It might have been when you, um, you know, wanted to build a utopian world just out of concrete. It might have been when you walked 500 kilometers through Spain and had to mentally endure it. It might have been when you were recently turning left and you didn't see an old lady crossing and you gave her a little nudge and um, she was okay. She might have had a little bruise, but I'm pretty sure she was okay. Um, or it might have been when you talked too much and embarrassed yourself in a situation like this. All of those experiences lead to something. So I believe that ideas come from experiences and moments, and then the styles come from inspiration and experimentation. So those past experiences that you have end up colliding with the present thoughts and the way that you're thinking, and then you can form ideas in the middle, hopefully. There's this thing called transient hyperfrontality, and it sounds quite complex, um, but it's not really. It was, it was coined by Arnie, Arnie Dietrich and Rex Jung, and they used to think it was uh, mainly, mainly throughout people with schizophrenia, addiction, um, and all sorts of mental disorders, but they've recently found that it is something that we can all sort of access. So the idea is that it's a temporary slowing of the brain. And what that allows is for, so think of the brain like a bit of a, when, when you're under pressure and you're thinking a lot and your brain's sort of rushing, it's like a super highway of thought. So your brain makes connections between the shortest possible distance to form a thought. But when this happens, when the brain slows down, your brain goes, it, it opens up little pathways or let's think of it dirt roads as metaphors and you travel new places and the brain thinks about different things that it hadn't, hadn't thought before. And it's often when you're in a deep state of relaxation or concentration. So think about when you do come up with ideas, it's always that shower moment or, um, you know, when you're walking the dog or when you're, you know, you've gone for a, a run somewhere. It's, it's never when you're sitting there trying to smash an idea. Because we all know that the creative process is like this. There's no shortest possible route. It's not from um, A to B in a direct line. It goes backwards, it goes forwards, it goes upside down and all around. So we need to unbusy our brains, stop and think and try and be present. So for me, design is about observation and interpretation. Um, any great designer, artist, musician, any of the creative fields will be observing their world and interpreting it in the way that they see it. And this is an incredibly important thing for me and has been for the last couple of years. There's a, a thing called actively noticing, which was coined by Ellen Langer, who was the, is the mother of mindfulness. So mindfulness is a very Buddhist sort of practice. And it's something that um, I've engaged with in more recently to calm down, slow down, um, and just be present. And the idea behind actively noticing is that it's not, it's not going, you know, walking into a shop and going, oh, fuck, they've used papyrus again. Jesus Christ, look at the kerning there. Or, you know, looking at a, a coding issue or, or seeing someone clash with colors and then picking out that. That's all really important stuff being a designer. That's what separates 
um, you know, creative people from the rest of the world. We can notice these, these imperfections and these minor details and then produce um, aesthetically pleasing responses. Actively noticing is engaging in the world, sitting, being present, um, not walking through the world mindlessly, um, understanding how people feel, listening to their responses, and really taking in the world. Because we, we so often walk through really quickly. I mean, just this morning on the peak hour train, so many, so much mindlessness, everyone sort of walking through. And I think it, it all comes down to being empathetic and understanding, understanding how, the, how other people feel in situations and how people respond to things. And empathy is huge, not only for you know, designers, I suppose, but it's important in life. So as a graphic designer, you, you have to be empathetic towards, well, probably any sort of designer creative. You have to be empathetic towards your client's needs and their expectations, and then you have to be empathetic towards um, the way that the target market is gonna respond to something. So you really have to understand and, um, and then interpret the world. So finding your voice is something that's quite important as a, as a creative to, um, I suppose, impose yourself some way on a situation, um, a, a work situation, because you know, people, people don't necessarily come to us for, for us to repeat a piece of Sagmeister's work at a cheaper cost or whatever it is. They come to us for um, our, our voices, our collective voices, and that's why people people would come to you guys. So it's really important to have an identity as a designer, and an identity will help you drive better ideas. So these are some of the things that I do that I can then take into the studio and Im impose my personality on the work that we produce. Um, I'll often be writing little wordplay things. I'm quite interested in, interested in language and how language works with design. So I'll write these little things. Sometimes I put them on Instagram, sometimes I keep them. Um, sometimes I just keep them in a scrapbook, and uh, they keep me engaged with language and interested. I'll often take little photographs of bigger scenes that have these tiny details, and this isn't revolutionary, but this helps me keep my eye engaged and keep me visually understanding how the world works and noticing these tiny little details. It's not necessarily to say that um, this, is how you, this is what you have to do to become a designer, um, these are little things that work for me and help me along my journey. I listen to podcasts as often as possible. If you don't, I highly recommend it. Um, it helps you get out of this, you know, work world, this design world that we're, we're so creative world, whatever it is that we're so wrapped in. Um, and, you know, listening to podcasts on art, science, psychology, um, you know, the, the sound of whales. I listened to one on maths. I hate maths, but it was a terrific, um, you know, insightful talk. So I encourage you to listen to these as often as possible. It helps me get ready for my work day as well. Uh, this was said to me recently, and it's one of my favorite things. I don't think the person that said it to me realized it was quite so profound, but um, if you're interested, you'll be interesting, and I, I fully believe that, um, and that's something that I've tried to engage in since I heard it, to be really interested in, in the world around me, not just what I'm doing. This one sounds harsh, um, and I never show this slide without explaining it. Um, but uh, this is more about the fact that you can't just sit there and, and drill out an idea, and that, that's proven with brainstorming and um, word association and all that sort of stuff. You have to have these good, bad, indifferent experiences that will all then reflect on you as a person and help you generate ideas. So as I said earlier, ideas come from the weirdest possible places, and I'm no expert at coming up with ideas, but I've had a, probably a pretty shitty 24 months and that's helped me reflect on, on my choices and the things that, things that are valuable to me and, and then, um, then obviously working them into how I work. We all know it's great getting outside your comfort zone because all of the good things are there, believe me. So what makes my ideas better than yours? Nothing. Um, Everyone loves George Costanza. These are, these are my ideas, and they're unique to me. They're not, maybe, they're, maybe they're not any good. Maybe they're, they're terrific. Um, but I think everyone needs their own personality and their own voice. And that's really important to take when you're seeing other people's work that is 
you know, mind blowing and, and it's taken out of context and you're just completely losing your shit and thinking you're rubbish. Um, everyone's ideas are terrific if you work on yourself. So I want to share a piece that um, I managed to install some of my personality into uh, one, of our, one of our projects. And we work with the Chapel Street precinct. Um, most of you would know Chapel Street. Some of you may have done chap laps up and down there or come out of Revolver at 10 in the morning. Um, so we were doing a Chapel Street press, which is a street press. Um, and we designed it all and it was, it was all going dandy and then we thought, okay, we need, we need a campaign to launch this. We need some street posters. We need a voice. This thing needs something so people know that it's arriving. This is some of the work that we produced for them. So we needed campaign copy and it was really last minute sort of stuff. Um, so we were briefed that it had to be memorable, bold, cheeky and attract attention. So I sort of began thinking, well, what, what is all of those things? And I thought I'd love to come up with a couple of puns. Um, everyone loves a pun. Some people actually really hate them, but I quite like them. Um, and I've been writing a lot of them and um, in friendship groups talking about them and they, ju they just seem to pop up everywhere. So I started writing these puns that would be focused around paper. I'll take you through a couple of them now. The paper that has more presents in Christmas Day. The paper that has better lines and in a bathroom at Revolver. This one was hard to get across the line given that they're a, um, they pay a levy to the Chapel Street precinct. I don't think they would have respected that. Um, the paper that has a longer shelf life than a cheeseburger. The paper that would disappear quicker than Tony Mockbell. Um, I didn't want to put this up there because you definitely want, don't want that bloke after you. The paper that has a higher interest rate than our major banks. The paper that's easier to pick up than a date from Tinder. And the paper that gets around more than Shane Warne. Now, they really like this one um, and it sort of worried me a little bit because as I said, we were, we were down to the wire, we needed to get these posters printed. No one had checked whether it was legal to name someone on a poster and I was a bit worried because they're one of our favorite clients and we didn't want to um, either of us be a legal issue, but it, he said this, this is a direct, direct client quote. And I was on the phone to him trying to explain that it probably wasn't a great idea. Um, so we went, with, we went with a couple of others. Um, this was sort of, this was basically his reaction to, to the world. Um, and so, these were some of the final pieces um, that went up all around the city. This was r right after they had that um, awful bachelor engagement problem and a few others that I read out a second ago. And the finished piece. We've just launched another one as well. So a process-driven idea. This is another case study on us changing the way that we work to generate new ideas. and. We were briefed by um, Simon from PeptoLab. PeptoLab is a um, Melbourne-based uh, digital studio. And he said, he came to us, he's worked in design for a long time, so he understands the process. And he said, I want you guys to do something completely different. Um, yeah, with, with the, obviously every client wants something different, but completely different with the process of how you get from um, the beginning to presenting me an idea. So we sat around for a while and we thought about it and we thought, let's present Let's uh, develop, design, and present everything on butcher's paper. Um, the great thing about that was that the idea really had to sing. It could, you couldn't gloss it over with um, a presentation that had it mocked up on a bus shelter or a whatever, whatever you can you know, find, a foiling, a foiling template or whatever it was. The idea had to be really, really good. And he, he was the type of client that could understand and interpret the idea that we put out on paper. Um, a lot of this won't work with a lot of clients. So we sat around for a number of days and let this uh, so-called meandering brain, which is the transient hyperfrontality set in place rather than rushing an idea. And, um, and we threw ideas out, we, we pulled them together, we went away, and it, it probably took a couple of weeks just of, just of talking rubbish. And um, we eventually presented them on butcher's paper. And, they look like shit, um, but the terrific thing about that was that um, you know the idea had to be really, really good. I can't actually share it with you because it's not finished, but um, 
it was one of those processes that we're really happy with the result and it was really quite interesting going through that and I'd, I'd definitely do it again. So why are ideas critical in this age? Um, look, tomorrow you'll probably hear a lot about, um, a lot more about technology and all of the sorts of things that are digitizing the world, I suppose. Um, a lot of the work that we're currently doing will be taken over by machines. So the democratization of design has begun. Our clients can now design a website if they want. Whether it's good or not is, is you know, up for debate, but they can, they can build a website based on a template. They could probably design a logo if they wanted. There, there would be something out there for that. And the one thing that we need to differentiate ourselves with is ideas and the way that we think coming up with something or being unique in a way that our clients can't or don't know how to access that, that type of information. So we need to be thinkers more so than doers. Um, I was talking about this the other day with a friend who's, a, who's an accountant and a joke went around saying that accountants are next. Um, and you know, design won't be far away. There'll be a whole lot of doers um, without jobs soon unless we start thinking. And once we do, we need to show the value of the thinking to our clients, um, rather than you know putting up our websites which have nice foils on them or nice letter presses or um, all of that sort of stuff. We need to we need to give them numbers. We need to give them. They love spreadsheets and all of that sort of stuff. Telling them how many how, how their membership engagement went after after a campaign or how their social media numbers went up or how their profits got, has gone up, and that's all through good thinking. And if you can take one thing away from this talk, it is to be yourself because everyone else is already taken. Thank you.